good. Um, so, um, hi everyone. Thank you all so much for attending our campaign manager panel. Uh, my name is Milo Chang and I'll be moderating today's panel. Um, we're really lucky to have our panelists, Roger Lau, Adisu Dimisi, and Maya Rupert with us today. Um, each of our panelists ran extraordinary campaigns during the 2020 presidential primaries. Uh, Roger ran Elizabeth Warren's campaign, Adisu ran Cory Booker's campaign, and Maya ran Julian Castro's campaign. So before we dive into introductions from each of our panelists, um, I'll start with a brief rundown of the format of today's panel. Um, I've prepared some questions to ask each of the panelists, and then we'll have some time near the end of the panel for some audience questions. And um, for audience members, you can drop your questions into the Q&A function at any time during the panel. And if I pick your question, I can unmute you so that you can ask our guests directly. And then we'll end with a closing question for the panelists. Um, so I know each of you has gone through like really extraordinary paths in life. And like, I'd never be able to summarize your stories while still doing them justice. So um, would you mind telling us about yourselves, like from where you grew up to how you wound, wound up, like where you are now? Uh, why don't we go to Adisu, then Maya and Roger? Uh, first of all, thanks for inviting me to be part of this. Uh, and it's good to see Roger and Maya uh, as well, who, uh, we were competitors, but we're friends. Uh, and that's one thing that you all should know. Uh, we've worked together. Roger and I, I think, worked together about 16 years ago on the Kerry campaign way back when. So, um, uh, that sounds old. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Sorry, before probably some of y'all were bored, which makes me feel very old. Uh, but, um, but real quick about me, I was actually born in Canada. Uh, my name is Adisu, it's Ethiopian. My father was an immigrant from Ethiopia to Canada. Don't ask me how that happened. Uh, my mother is, um, a black woman, uh, uh, sort of half Canadian, half American. So I'm a very much a mix of cultures, uh, but I, I grew up in Canada and moved to the States when I was 11 uh, and moved to Atlanta. And my political awakening was uh, sort of in the 90s and uh, early 2000s. Um, as I was in my teenage years, high school years, uh, with I was talking to somebody about this this morning, uh, you know, Prop 187 and 209 out here in California, where I am, was happening at that moment, a big backlash uh, uh, moment uh, in racial politics. Uh, we had the 2000 election, which obviously was a major moment, historical and otherwise, in this in in our country's history. And then September 11th, when I was I actually had just moved to DC and taken my first job and uh, in the summer of 2001 um, when that happened. And so um, real quick about my uh, sort of foray into politics, really after September 11th and the Iraq war run up in 2002, I, I was basically devoted. I decided I needed to do something to get rid of George Bush, <laughs> uh, whatever, whatever that was. And I didn't really know what that meant. And uh, uh, checked in with a couple of mentors of mine who uh, some of you may have heard of Ben Jealous uh, who ran from governor of Maryland uh, last year, um, a guy named Jonathan Epstein. Uh, I was working at the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, so a woman named Elaine Jones, who ran that organization, and they all sort of pointed me towards becoming a field organizer uh, for a presidential campaign and found my way to Iowa to work for John Kerry. Uh, that was in the summer of 2003 on my birthday. Uh, actually, it was my first day in politics 17 years ago, in campaign politics at least. And my career has sort of taken me from there to... Uh, it's been a whirlwind uh, uh, from campaign to campaign. I've run, uh, you know, I ran Cory Booker Senate race. I ran Governor Gavin Newsom here in California's governor's race. And then obviously, as Milo said, President uh, Cory Booker's campaign for president. So it's been a winding road. It doesn't really make sense. I didn't pick it. It kind of picked me, but it's been a blast. Uh, and I've loved every minute of it. And I haven't found anything else that uh, that gets me up in the morning and makes me as passionate as, as sort of working to elect good people and promote good causes via the ballot box. Roger, who is next, Maya? I think I'm up next, yeah. <laughs> Thanks for that. Um, and thank you all seriously for joining us today. I'm really excited about this conversation. So um, I am from Southern California. I'm from a small town um, in Southern Cal California called Yucca Valley. It was, when I was growing up, very small town um, and predominantly white um, town with the exception of my family. Um, we were, you know, that was typically all white um, in the, 
classes that I was in and the, the, the places that I tended to be. And that really shaped the way I think and talk about race for a very long time. I never wanted to talk about it. Um, and then I sort of, you know, went through my own process around racial identity and, and figuring out how to talk about it in a way that didn't, you know, it was sort of when you're young so many times, what you just want is to blend in with everybody else. Um, and not talking about it felt like the way to do that, even though it didn't really work. And so I feel like a lot of my process, specifically around talking about race and identity has been figuring out that you don't have to sort of sublimate the pieces of yourself that are different in order to feel like you're, you know, sort of united and with other people. So that was kind of um, a, sort of a, a, a process for me. When I, you know, I, I left um, Yucca Valley, went to college, um, and I found myself interested in, in politics broadly, but I had a very, very limited idea of what that meant. Um, and so while I was always kind of interested in it, I never thought of myself as somebody who was going to work in politics. Um, I went after college, I went to law school and, um, you know, I started working for a, a, a firm. I was, you know, a litigator at a, at a big firm and I did still kind of have this draw. I had the sense that I wanted to do something different. But like I said, my idea of politics was, it was a very, it was just a very narrow vision. It was you know, you, you needed to, what one, you need to be able to work for free for a while because that was a lot of times like internships and things like that. That's kind of how I understood it. But secondly, I really thought it was like, you needed to know people, you need, you know, it, there, it wasn't, it wasn't the most accessible field. So when I kind of realized I didn't want to keep practicing a lot and I wanted to do something different, the kind of middle ground I struck was policy work. Like I, I thought that, you know, it would take me to DC, I would get a chance to do things that were sort of kind of political adjacent, but I could do them from a different standpoint and an orientation I think that made a little more sense to me, which was through kind of social justice movements. I tended to be drawn toward this idea that it was kind of activism that was going to lead the way and politicians could be, you know, partners and friends sometimes, but they definitely weren't going to be the leaders. You know, we had to do it from the community first and that's how the, the process was going to kind of work. And so, I worked for a number of organizations and I ended up going to HUD, um, the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Um, uh, and that's where I met Julian Castro for the first time. He was the secretary there. He and I worked on a couple of projects and what I realized about him was that, well, okay, if politicians, if there are politicians who see things like this, like he talks like one of us, you know, he's asking me questions about who's being left out. He's asking questions about how we can make sure that things reach the most pe people as possible. And that was the first time I kind of thought to myself, okay, well, if there are people who see the world like this, like I can work in politics. So I ended up um, developing a good relationship with him and just sort of, you know, we got close. And when he decided to run, I decided, you know, I, I, I wanted to be with him. So my path is a little different because it's not steeped in electoral politics, but I feel like the, you know, I, I never felt like I was shifting. Um, you know, away from the stuff that I prioritized and cared about in order to go into politics, which I think speaks to some really incredible people who run, um, including both um, of the campaigns that um, my fellow panelists ran as well. So I think that was a pretty exciting ed, um, thing about the cycle. And uh, I'm Roger Lau. Um, and thank you all of you guys for inviting us uh, to be part of this. It's uh, fun to um, you know, be doing this with Adisu and Maya. You know, it's, uh, as uh, Adisu said, you know, he and I worked together for a long time, been around in the same circles. And, you know, the fun thing about campaigns and even primaries when you're running against each other is that, you know, you have friends along the way, you make friends along the way. And, you know, I think uh, some of my best moments during the uh, campaign was actually hanging out with other campaign staffs and getting to know them. So uh, that part's been really fun. But um, Milo, you know, thank you for pulling this together. Miriam, Sashu, and Julian, thank you for making sure that everyone else can, can participate as well. So we appreciate that. Um, so I was born and raised in New York City uh, by two immigrant parents who both came to the United States from China. They both worked two jobs. They were barely ever home, um, but, you know, gave us a lot of loving and, uh, you know, gave us as many resources as they can give us. You know, I went to public schools, you know, throughout my entire life until I was 13 uh, when I made the brilliant decision of uh, stopping and going to school. Uh, this was in high school. I'm rocking my high school t-shirt today uh, just to represent you all. Um, but yeah, no, I stopped going to school when I was 13 or 14 and, um, you know, wound up getting in some trouble. You know, I had probably the, the not so traditional route to, uh, in life with a lot of this, um, but I wound up getting in trouble legally, um, done things, some things I'm not super proud of. And it wasn't until later in life, you know, probably when I was 19 years old that I wound up taking my GED, my high school equivalency, uh, that I wound up sort of 
examining what it is I wanted to do. Um, so, you know, I wound up taking my SAT shortly after that and wound up going to school uh, as far away as I possibly could think of going at the time because I knew in order for me to succeed, I had to get away from New York City. And at the time, what seemed far away was Massachusetts, uh, which, you know, now looking back at it, especially for those of you who don't live in the Northeast, it's not far at all. Um, but went there, you know, sort of, uh, you know, like many of you probably uh, thinking, just trying to figure out what I wanted to do, how I wanted to do it. Um, you know, I think I was maybe four different majors before I sort of landed on political science. And, you know, that's when I decided, you know, that's uh, a passion, something I wanted to learn more about. I wasn't quite sure if it's something I wanted to do for a living, but um, I just enjoyed it. I loved it. And through that, I wound up uh, applying for an internship for then Senator John Kerry uh, in one of his smaller offices in the Senate side in Springfield, Massachusetts. Um, and just fell in love with constituent services, fell in love with, you know, being able to connect people who otherwise just felt like they had no connection to the federal government at all uh, with federal services. And, you know, many times, you know, it, you're able to help people. So a lot of times you can't, but the opportunity to help people connect when they feel such a sense of desperation. Um, I mean, when you think about it, it's, by the time someone calls an elected official, it's because they've exhausted every single last resource. And being able to be that and being sort of that affirmation of the fact that our government can work and can care, uh, I think was something that was really motivating and inspiring for me. So, you know, after interning for him in college, I wound up, uh, you know, getting uh, offered an opportunity to work on his Senate staff in Boston for John Kerry. Uh, and, you know, that was sort of the start of the, the history. I worked for him, you know, on and off for 14 years uh, in the Senate office. The reason why I say on and off is because, you know, I was a kid that he would send out to work on different campaigns, including his own in 2003, 2004, where I met Adisu. Um, and also a presidential campaign where uh, DC and I sort of overlapped again, working for Hillary Clinton. Um, and the last campaign that John Kerry sort of dispatched me to work on was for this uh, Democratic challenger against a popular incumbent Republican in Massachusetts, whose name was Scott Brown. The candidate was Elizabeth Warren. Uh, at the time, I thought she had no shot of winning because um, Scott Brown was very popular, had a lot of money. And what I said to John Kerry at the time was, I don't know if Elizabeth Warren's going to win. He said, why not? And I said, well, she's a Harvard Law School professor. She's from Oklahoma, and all she does is talk about banking. Nobody cares about banking, which, by the way, tells you how wrong I was at the time. And you know, obviously, I and the rest of the country learned a lot since then. And I think uh, Elizabeth's been a big part of that moment uh, of teaching the country. So, uh, but it's been an amazing ride. Uh, like Adisu said, it's um, not something I thought I would be doing when I was 13 or 18. Um, if you told me then, you know, this is the path I, I would take, I would have laughed. I think all my friends would have. Um, but I, you know, it's something that I still wake up every single morning excited about the things that get me excited about, um, the work from when I first started as an intern remain the same and I'm going to keep on doing it so long as I feel this way. Awesome. So, um, I know that Maya sort of touched upon this earlier, but, um, in politics, it often seems as though like you don't have a chance at advancing in your career unless you have the time and resources to start from like an unpaid internship and like work your way up. So um, what are your thoughts about this sort of type, this type of pipeline and like what actions, if any, should we take about this? Um, so for this question, why don't we go Roger first, then Adisu, and then Maya? You know, that's a really, really good question. And I think it's a question that um, the Democratic Party, progressive politics, um, certainly people of color in politics, and frankly, everyone should be thinking about it. I Part of the reason, as I mentioned, that I get excited about what we get to do is because I know it's a privilege. You know, I think that Maya and Adisa would probably agree that in a lot of ways, you know, obviously, most people on the planet, uh, most people in our country, they work to live, they work to pay bills, they work to take care of kids, they work to take care of buy homes and mortgages and pay rent, um, and maybe if you're lucky, you know, take vacations. For those of us who've decided to do this, um, at least early on, I think in the beginning, you know, it's instead of working to live, you're living to work, right? Because you feel a deep sense of passion for what it is that we're fighting for, what we believe in. And it's not a normal job. And in many ways, I feel like it's in a lot of ways, it's less of a career, maybe more of a calling. And again, you're very much a privilege to get to do what you do. I mean, I think Maya and Disa can probably speak to this too, but you know, um, this is still a space where 
you know, people who can afford to do it, people who have the time to do it, uh, are, you know, still predominantly the people who are in this space uh, because, you know, in a lot of ways, you know, the, either salaries are low uh, or the, or, or non-existent. Uh, and, you know, it's not like these jobs are often posted uh, in places that are accessible, like, you know, monster.com or Craigslist. Um, you know, maybe I'm dating myself. I don't even know where these jobs are posted anymore. But, um, you know, it, it's accessibility. It's a network that, you know, you know someone who knows someone who gets you hired. I mean, that's how, you know, in some ways it worked for all, all of us. And, you know, I think it's a, a very important conversation that, you know, our party is having. I think a very conversation that, important conversation that all of us, the three of us are probably having internally right now. You know, how do we make it more accessible, right? You know, and part of that is making sure we're intentional about including people and making sure that the people who work on these campaigns are minimally reflective of the people we're seeking to represent. But, you know, also finding ways to make it accessible financially and socially too. So, um, you know, I think all of our campaigns, you know, made efforts to do that by making sure that internships are paid and we weren't just, you know, exploiting, you know, uh, workers for free when our candidates are out there, you know, uh, championing these causes um, in the private sector, making sure that our employees uh, are paid a decent wage, you know, uh, at least minimally $15 an hour. When DC and I started, you don't even want to know what the salaries were. Uh, and this is not just like a back in the day kind of thing. Like it wasn't that long ago. I got paid. I got paid five hundred dollars a month for uh, my first three months on the carry campaign. Right. Exactly. No health insurance. I'm sure. Which I, could not, which yeah. I could not afford. I don't know. I don't even honestly remember how I did it. But yeah. Right. Uh, yeah, you're, you're a healthy, strapping young man. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no. I mean, it, but it wasn't right. And, and frankly, you know, I don't know exactly uh, everyone's background, but I know that I was able to do it in part because of sacrifices and in part because of you know the kindness of friends and in some cases family. Um, that's not the way it should be anymore. And I think that. All of us have become more cognizant of it, making sure that, you know, through paying for internships and creating that pipeline in a real way for all people, um, making sure that salaries and wages are actually livable, you know, as, again, as our bosses talk about. And then, frankly, also, uh, in some cases, making sure that our staff have the right to organize, you know, bargain collectively to ask for benefits and, you know, work with manage, uh, management to make decisions. I mean, those are all things that our candidates have talked about. Those are all things that I know Democrats have been talking about, and um, it, it, the, the, uh, there are many cultural aspects to this too, and, and social barriers as well. But I think a big part of it is being intentional about it and actually literally putting your money where your mouth is, and you know, walking the walk and making sure that you know people actually have realistic ways of uh, entry paths you know, to get to this you know, career. Yeah, I'll be real quick. I, I mean, amen to Roger, everything he said. It was very important to Corey and to me that we had paid internships in, on our campaign. I know it was to Roger and, and Maya and their candidates as well, uh, in many ways because, you know, of the activism that I think a lot of folks that probably are on this <laughs> call uh, uh, have pushed us to be to do over the last couple of years, but also for all the reasons that Roger said. And the other thing, you know, I even referenced this in my intro, Networks are definitely how a lot of things happen in politics, and I'm as guilty of that as anybody. Um, but diversifying those networks uh, is really important. It's part of the reason I wanted to do this with y'all, uh, because, um, you know, I was just lucky that two of the people I mentioned in my opening, Ben Jealous and Elaine Jones, both African-American folks, very, at that point, engaged in politics, saw something in me and wanted to help me and connected me with the right person. I had to go through an interview process and get the job, but... Um, but uh, uh, they, you know, I'm not sure that, uh, <laughs> that I didn't have a network of, you know, uh, white folks to do that for me, to be blunt. I, it, was, it, was, it was the black folks who stepped up for me. And that I hopefully, I think actually is, is changing at the top of the Democratic Party. I think that the people who are not people of color, people who do not come from privilege are actually a little more conscious of that, of that, um, that of, of the pipeline that they're creating, but it's on us to push. And, and frankly, as a person of color, I feel a specific responsibility to fulfill that role now that I've reached a place where I can. And, you know, people look out to me <laughs> to, to, to help do that. So it is a very difficult problem. Uh, it is not one that is easy to solve. It's going to take time and people like us, I suppose, Roger and Maya, now that I say it out loud, to help do that. But I ask you guys too to keep pushing us on it um, because trust me, it, it is it has an effect. Uh, uh, to get that pressure from the folks who are going to be someday in, in the seats that we sit in. And I will just say, yes, absolutely um, echo everything both uh, Roger and Adisu just said. And just to add to that, I think 
one thing is, you know, encouraging candidates, you know, kind of, it's, it's, su it's such a tough thing because it does become kind of a race to the bottom. If it's possible to not pay interns, there will always be some candidates who, honestly, they don't have the money for it. And if it's, if, if there, if there exists a market for it, people almost feel like you can't afford not to. That was something we, you know, we, we, it was, it was such a priority for, for myself, for Julian to make sure that we were paying interns. But honestly, when we were starting, we, you know, Julian was not in an existing uh, role when we launched our campaign. So we were in this, you know, we, everything we were building, we were really building from scratch. And it would have been really helpful to have had some people that could help us build it who we weren't paying immediately. And we had to make that call based on his values and what we actually want the party to, the, the, the sort of leadership to, to look like and what we want, you know, so it was, it was one of those moments where, you know, there was a way to justify it, but you couldn't justify it if you, if you factored in values, morals that we're fighting for every day, right? So I think, you know, encouraging candidates, regardless of, of financial situation to do it, really does, I think that, you know, that's how we're gonna move the field on, on specifically paying interns. And I would say the second thing is, for a while, we are not gonna have a very deep bench or pipeline of folks of color. Um, who are, you know, who have, who have had certain experiences in order to move into some of these roles, um, just because of the nature of this. And for so long, it had not been a priority. If people say, well, look, I'm looking at the people that have run campaigns before, or who have been consultants who have made, who've, who've done some of these big jobs on campaigns, and there's just not a lot of diversity, that's going to be true. And it's going to be true for a little while. What I would urge people to think about in those moments is, are there skills that are that are comparable? Are there things that can translate from other areas? Because it's not like if you broaden what you're considering your pipeline, you won't be able to find really talented people of diverse backgrounds that can do jobs. So that, I think that's the other piece is we have to challenge ourselves to not think of experience so narrowly that you literally had to have done this thing before. Because if we keep doing that, then yeah, our pipeline is going to be what it is. But I think we have to broaden our pipeline. Um, so sort of just like um, tacking on to what Maya said, um, historically, like the political figures who've dominated our nation's leadership have been like affluent white men, and none of you fit into this mold. So I wanted to ask, like, in the political world, do you think it's easy to feel a sense of like imposter syndrome? And if so, like, how do you deal with that? And sort of like, sorry to like, add another follow up to that question, like, how important do you think experience in politics is versus genuine passion? Um, so for this question, uh, why don't we go Maya, Vajra, then Adisi? Sure. sure. Well, absolutely. I mean, yeah, yes, I definitely still feel imposter syndrome. I don't know that there's a point at which you grow out of that, which I will just say, hopefully that sounds um, inspiring and not depressing. And I say that because if you feel it, knowing that regardless of where you get to in your career, people still feel that, don't think it's, it's something you need to, you know, it's like, oh, well, if I really were qualified for this job, I wouldn't be feeling it. Everybody feels it. And if everybody feels it, then you can feel it and still do the job that you are doing. Go for the opportunity that you want to go for. Just do it because we're all, we all feel to some extent like we're faking it. And the second piece of that is honestly, sometimes that's true because we kind of are faking it. <laughs> and I feel like one thing in politics that is, it's hard because we do, there's so much thought about, well, if you haven't done this job, this job, and this job, well, then you obviously can't do this job. Here's the thing, just like any other industry, there's a lot of stuff that is, that is technical and specific and you won't know it until you know it, right? So there are, obviously benefits you have from having been around, you know, having been on different campaigns before and seen how things have done. Um, so I don't want to say it's not valuable to have experience. I think it's incredibly valuable. But I also think that just like in any industry, you can learn a lot of that stuff. And you need, you know, listen to the people who know what they're talking about, recognize the places that you don't know, and bring in people that are smarter than you on stuff that you don't know. But limiting yourself in this industry in particular, because you don't have a certain set of experiences, is that when I hear people do that, it it makes me, you know, it's it's so hard to hear because this is one industry that really benefits from people bringing their lived experience and having that be what helps them 
make decisions and make recommendations. Like we need people who haven't spent an entire lifetime working in electoral politics, but have very different perspectives because we're talking to a community of people that are as varied and different as all of those perspectives are. And so I hope people feel like passion and a desire to do good um, can be the sort of building blocks that mean, yes, come in, you're welcome, you should be, you should be taking on these opportunities. And a lot of that stuff you can learn. It's really just like most things. There's a lot of stuff that you can learn. And then there's, um, you know, there's this, the sort of indescribable piece that that can that can make you really successful yeah, i agree with everything maya said uh 100 i mean it's uh imposter syndrome is probably a word a phrase i use too frequently uh maya knows you know, she and i are close and talk about a lot of this stuff uh you know even now in terms of you know how we as you know people who've been in, in the business longer and you know make or, or leaders uh and should be leaders um in the field in the party you know, how we sort of move in these spaces is something that we think about a lot. And, you know, part of it is making sure that we are being intentional and authentic about who we are and who we are to ourselves, but also making sure that, you know, we are representing our communities well, and at the same time, representing ourselves well, you know, it's a, it's a balance. And, you know, when I first started working in politics, at least in Boston, uh, there were not many people of color working in politics. If there were any, it, were, it was people who were hired to specifically work within their community and only within their own, their own community or they're working in support roles and i very quickly saw that um while those roles are important and necessary and good starting points very often um people were just not given opportunities to have wider experiences that allowed you to move into different uh roles and uh with more responsibility in politics and you know i remember you know boston you know as you can imagine a lot of you know white irish, irish catholic people and you know they identify by what county of ireland they're from what parish church they go they go to uh where they summered uh, on the cape i didn't even know summering was a verb uh at the time to me it was crazy uh that when someone asked that question did you summer what did you summer did you summer with so-and-so um you know so i definitely you know sort of faked it until i made it made it in a lot of different ways where you know, I knew I wasn't going to fit in. I knew there were things I didn't get. I knew there were cultural references I didn't understand, um, just because you know my background was a little bit different. Um, but you know, I acknowledged those differences and accepted that, that it was okay for me. But you know, tried to find ways to contribute in my own way, um, meeting people where they are, but at the same time also being authentic as to who I am. And you know, as far as like the whole imposter syndrome thing, I think it goes in other directions too. And I think it's especially true for sort of public facing figures like us who are in politics where you know we are dealing with imposter syndrome from time to time in the workplace but as representatives of these organizations going back to our communities and you know what people see in us i mean for example very often i think a lot of people assume i'm asian american so you know these are quote unquote the good stereotypes uh, he must have went to harvard he must be brilliant he must be this and the reality is as i said i dropped out of high school when i was 13 you know i was involved in some you know stuff i wasn't proud of um, and so, you know, trying to meet the expectations of our own communities sometimes is a thing as well. And, you know, it it's, goes to show that I hope I'm an example of this. I think Adisa is an example of this. Maya is an exa example of this. We all have sort of non-traditional backgrounds based on who we are, where we're from, geographic where, where we are, our career paths, trajectories. But um, experience matters, but it's not necessarily experience in politics. As Maya says, we benefit from having people from different parts of it. Uh, it is not the case that the only people who are out to change the world are the people who have already been involved for 100 years. Um, it's simply not true. And frankly, having worked for, you know, um, a range of candidates who are establishment types, more moderate types, more progressive types, more outsider insurgent types, it's been fun to be able to work with people with different backgrounds because they're bringing in not only new ideas, but entirely new networks of people who've never been involved before and the ideas that come along with it. So that's that that. It's the, the passion and the diversity of it is what keeps us vibrant and exciting and I think interesting, you know, to voters. Yeah. Yeah, this is a, I mean, it's a real, it's real. Uh, <clears throat> what Maya said up front, I, I just want to echo. It's like, I remember when, when I was considering when Corey offered me the job to run his presidential campaign, my first <laughs> was like, what, <laughs> you know, uh, can I do this? And like, the reality is like, yeah, I could do it, but it took me 
some time to convince myself of that. Um, and frankly, it took, and you guys have both alluded to this, it took doing it to realize that I could, that I could do it. Um, I certainly made mistakes and like experiences without question, the best teacher, but you have to put yourself in uncomfortable positions and positions where you might have imposter syndrome to, to realize that. Right. And so there's no doubt that it's real, but um, it, it, that feeling is the necessary discomfort to, mm. to gaining, you know, to getting ahead in this business, I think in a lot of ways. And there is no doubt that the, the other thing I will say about this is humility is really, really important here because there is, you know, we, we have been rightly, I think, excoriating some of the older, you know, less diverse, uh, you know, old school type folks who have, have lived this business, but like they're, in many ways there for some good reasons too, <laughs> which is like, they know what they're doing. Uh, and to, and even where you might come from a different place, you might provide a different perspective. You might disagree with them. Um, coming and th those people, and whether they are diverse or, or not look like you or don't, um, going with a sense of humility to the folks who have, who have come before you and learning from them. I have found white, black, male, female, you name it that is usually received with an incredible openness in our party. Um, and it's very, you know, it's the folks who come and think that they know exact, know everything, even if you know a lot, even if you have a totally different perspective, they're the ones who get pushed to the side. But if you come and say, look, I disagree with you on this, but I wanna learn why you come from this perspective, or I don't understand this piece of the business, can you can you teach me? The, the people at the top of the business, um, I guess I'm one of those people now, Ugh, that's weird to say. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, are usually, certainly as I was coming up in my 20s and 30s, they were willing to sit down with me. They were willing to, to import, impart that knowledge and, and be mentor a, a mentor for me. And um, finding that as you are on the up makes it a little bit easier to not have that imposter syndrome because you know, if I don't understand how to run a budget, if I don't understand polling, if I can't read, you know, if, if I don't know where this person is coming from politically or otherwise, this I can lean on these people who've been there before to, to coach me through it. And that's been really, really important to me. And if I actually can add on that, these two and I, in many ways, were sort of raised by a lot of these establishment types. Uh, I, these I don't, I don't mean to out you, but you know, no, no, it's, you're right. It's what it was at the time, right? And honestly, a lot in a lot of ways, these were my mentors, and many of them are still my professional heroes. Um, you know, recognizing that the, the 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 time that they came from and how the world has changed and how these two and my and I have grown, but. Uh, it's not just that we've benefited from their mentorship and the opportunities they gave us, but I think in a lot of ways, uh, and I think these two would, would agree with this, they're learning from us now too as the world's changing and they're coming to us and like, what can we do better? You know, uh, you know, because they want to change too and they want they see that you know we're part of that change that came from them. Yeah, you know? um, but it's been fascinating to watch that that part of the party move in that way. So like, I'm sure that all of our attendees like really envy the position each of you is in, like being able to work <laughs> for such notable elected officials. Um, can you share with us like what it's like to be in your position and to like have your responsibilities? Is it as glamorous as it seems or um, let's go Adisu, Maya, then Roger. I mean, there are moments, uh, yeah, there are moments, I guess, right? I remember, uh, during the primaries being at the debate in the spin room and being like, Oh man, Whoa, I'm like here, like there were West Wing episodes about this, you know, <laughs> kind of like, and you know, you can't be too cool for school. Like there are definitely moments where you're like, this is awesome. It's a job, but like I made it to this, this place. Uh, so yes, is the answer. There are some glamor moments, but the majority of it is not, uh, it's a job and it's a, it's a, and, and I don't, I don't want to discount what Roger said earlier too. It's also a calling. It's more than a job. It's why I haven't been able to leave in 20 years and mm -hmm. you know, may never be able to because I could get up in the morning every day and feel like I'm changing the world. Um, but it is a job ultimately. And um, you know, when you're sitting in a room with a uh, Cory Booker or a Julian Castro or an Elizabeth Warren or whoever it might be uh, having, you know, important conversations about strategy or policy or whatever it is like, you are representing you have a you have a job to do in that sometimes it's just to run the meeting sometimes it's to give your opinion sometimes it's uh uh to you know convince your candidate to do one thing and not the other whatever it might be and you got to keep your eyes on the prize of of that and that is work it's not just you know it it 
and over the course of time, certainly as I've gotten older and gotten into more of those rooms, it's become less shocking to me to do and less glamorous as it were. But, um, but I, yeah, I won't lie. There's some cool, there's some cool stuff. I went on a call with Oprah and Sp Steven Spielberg the other day and I was like, this is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like how, how did that happen? Uh, uh, and you know, it's, it's, there are glamour moments, but make no mistake, the, the road to those moments and the roads, you know, between those moments can be anything but. Uh, and, and the majority of it is 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 tough hard work that you know goes early in the morning to late at night and that's you know frankly what I like about this too uh, uh, is that I still work as hard now as I did as when I was a field organizer and it's just a different context absolutely agree with that I mean there are there there are and like I we all laughed <laughs> at the question about how glamorous it is because it's just like there are so many minute the, mi moments in between that you're like this is so not glamorous um but it's, I think especially at, at the sort of manager level it's like people hear the title and it's like that's so cool and like you're like you know I'm reviewing budgets and I'm you know it's like so sometimes it's just it is it's the most it's you know, shockingly similar to a lot of other jobs. You're on some level a campaign manager. You're you're managing an organization of people. It's it's the, it's the same job that people you know who are leading any team have. And so there's there are those moments in between that just feel like so not what you know people envision. But for sure, like I don't think I'll ever get tired of. You know, I like I said, my background had been sort of in policy stuff. I, I I'm that I get so excited about that kind of thing. And so getting a chance to have policy discussions with these people who are brilliant who are then going to go and and you know and you can you know convince someone of something you have that moment where you're like yes this is what we need to say and here's why and then you're actually able to do it like i think being in a position to shape the way people are talking about the issues that matter the most for our communities is something i will never ever like that the privilege of that will never get sort of stale to me um or just the knowledge that it's like you can say something in a conversation um, to someone who then goes and says it, like that's how they're going to talk about that, this issue on a debate stage in, you know, on, in press. I mean, that's, there's something incredibly heady about that that never, ever gets old. But I would definitely, definitely encourage you, that if you're interested in this, to remember that those times are incredible and they can get you through, but they're going to have to get you through a lot of times where it doesn't feel that glamorous. And it, it feels like a slog and it feels like a job or you're getting hammered and it feels you know, like people are, you know, being awful on the internet, you know, so I mean, it's like there, are, there are those moments, but you have to, that can't be the reason you want to do it because you will be disappointed. I'll, I'll start with the unglamorous part, um, or like what feels like the unglamorous part. When, when you first started working in this business, you know, you sort of, in the movement, whatever you want to call it, you know, you're doing things, you're knocking on doors, you're organizing people, you're out there meeting people, you're, um, you know, doing phone banks, you know, and eating bad pizza, uh, and eventually someday we beer for you guys too, um, maybe. But, you know, it, it's very social, and you, you have a task in front of you, you have to get it done, you're advancing a, a big event, you're doing political outreach, all these sorts of things. And it's funny, never in my wildest dreams that I think that the more I moved up in the business, the fewer opportunities I would have to do all those things. And eventually, I, I figured out one day, I'm like, wow, my entire job is to be sitting in this conference room doing meetings after meetings and phone calls and Zooms and whatever all day because it turns out that when you have experience, your job is to make decisions, right, and to work with people and give them advice. And it was it was almost jarring at first. It felt like so disconnected from what I'd spent the last, you know, 20 years doing, um, actually being the one to do, but, like, you're, suddenly you're responsible for deciding a lot of important things. Um, and I think the other part, and this one's a little more somber, which is, and I'm, I feel like, you know, Adisa, Adisa Maya and probably others can relate to this too, um, there are glamorous parts to it, but there's still portions and parts where you are reminded what a privilege this is, and uh, we still have a lot of work to do. I think as people of color, there are often times when we are, as campaign manager, at these debates, at these big events, where someone doesn't think that we're the campaign manager, based on just appearances. And even if you have the right, you know, credentialing, you know, even if you um, are wearing a suit, uh, people may think you're a volunteer or an intern or security or just don't flat out belong there. Um, so that, that's humbling as well. But, you know, I think, um, you know, as Lisa said, there have been some really cool and interesting and exciting parts to it where you're like, holy cow, I can't believe I'm here, right? 
for me, one of the coolest things was looking at this cycle and, and seeing myself, Adisu, Maya, John Rodriguez, who worked for Kamala Harris's campaign, Faz, who worked for Bernie's campaign, and seeing their names in the newspaper, you know, people I've known over the years in different ways, or even seeing us all in the same rooms in, in like the process of how we elect the president of the United States. And like, that's pretty freaking cool because it did not look like that a long time ago. Awesome. So um, our next question comes from Oak, uh, who's in the audience. Um, Hi. Uh, so my name is Luke, and um, I'm from Pennsylvania. So I wanted to ask uh, if you ever have uh, any real ideological or policy differences uh, with your candidates and how you try to reconcile that. And for this question, why don't we go uh, Maya, Roger, then Adisu? Sure. Um, so I definitely wouldn't say ideological or like, like I, I don't, I couldn't, I don't have this experience and maybe, maybe um, either Roger or Disu um, who've worked for more campaigns can talk more to genuinely having like a difference of, a, of opinion with a, with a candidate about like the underlying issue. I, there were definitely times where, you know, Julian and I disagreed about, it was never sort of the issue it was more about tactic, right? So it was like, we would, we, I, I don't know how it would be to try to, um, to, to try to deal with like a genuine, like I, you know, sort of some, some kind of fundamental disagreement, but I'm trying to think of a good example of, I mean, there were definitely times I think, um, you know, we, 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 we talked about this um, a lot. I don't think one of us had one position. We both changed ideas a couple of times, but I think one really good example is when we, um, decided to put out um, an immigration plan as sort of our first big policy um, move. And the, and the debate there was around whether as the sole Latino candidate in the field, it made sense for him to have his kind of first big policy um, release be an immigration plan just because of how people were gonna perceive that and sort of talk about, um, you know, that it was sort of the brown guy leaning in on brown things and that that would be sort of a, that would be kind of perceived a certain way. And so, uh, you know, we, we definitely, we kind of went back and forth about that. I, I felt like, and I, you know, sort of still believe it's, you're at your best when you can let your candidate be exactly who they are. The fact of the matter is he wanted to put out an immigration plan and I didn't see a value of weight. You know what I mean? Like it was like, that was his genuine instinct. And so I felt like we should lean into his genuine instincts um, and we ended up doing it. But I, I, I don't know what it would be like if sort of within that plan, we were genuinely having disagreements about the, the underlying issues. I think that would just be a harder relationship to have campaign manager to candidate, because I do think you have to, I, I think so much of the job is translating their vision into you know, a policy platform, a strategy to win and everything else. And if there was, if there was genuine daylight there, I, I think that would be a tougher job to do. Yeah, I, that, it, it's a really good question. I, let me start off by saying I never disagree with Elizabeth Warren. <laughs> um, but, and, you know, but like, look, you're, you're never going to find anyone in life and politics and uh, even, you know, relationships that you're going to agree with on everything 100% all the time. Um, I have certainly had disagreements with candidates I've worked for in terms of policy and um, maybe how votes could or should have been casted or how things should have been done. Um, and it's tough, but I think at the end of the day, what I've always tried to do is understand the intent of what it is they're trying to accomplish and what it is they believe in. Um, and, you know, again, you know, there, there's a lot of gray areas. I mean, you know, the way voting works and the way a lot of these issues are framed, it's yes or no. And the reality is there's a whole lot of gray in between, for, especially for complicated issues uh, like foreign policy or economics or something like that. Um, but it, it is important to me that separate from that, you know, that I understand, you know, where their heart is, where their values are, and their intent of, you know, what it is they want to accomplish, you know, how you want to provide health care for everyone, you know, how you want to achieve world peace. Um, and those things are, are important. And if I have a fundamental disagreement in terms of the values, I, that's something... I, I would have a problem with. And, um, and, you know, frankly, I think as a staffer, your job is to, you know, not just keep it to yourself and, and stew about it, you know, which I think I've certainly done in the past. And I think, you know, obviously many young staffers do as well. But, you know, I think your candidates need to hear from you. Your, your uh, principals need to hear from you. Uh, because at the end of the day, it helps you understand, 
you know, where they're coming from as well. And it helps you do your job better as you're having to talk about these complicated issues to the voters. Yeah, I totally agree with that last point in particular. Um, I think there's a part of the privilege of being in the rooms like that is to be able to, is, is the responsibility of speaking up and making your opinion known even when it's, you know, it, your, your opinion isn't the one that your principal takes. And so um, I would say, sure, I definitely disagreed with I disagree with Corey. I disagree with Gavin Newsom. Like I've, I've disagreed with some of the things they've done in their career and some of the things that they decided to do in, during a campaign that I've run, but I never, that opinion is, I, I'm not afraid to express that opinion. Let's put it, let's put it like that. And that may shape their thinking now and going forward. And that's, you know, ha having no, having, the, that's where overcoming the imposter syndrome and having sort of mm. the, 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 the mm. lack of fear or the courage or whatever it might be to speak up to people who have more power than you or who have more experience than you is, is really important because I think that's why you're there, you know, and sometimes it's mm -hmm. hard to remember that the reason why you're there is to express your opinion. Um, even if it's one that is, you know, that doesn't end up being taken. And other thing I will say is just my philosophy on this is something that I've has evolved over my career and how I pick candidates to work for and what have you. I used to be in a place where I wanted to find the person with whom I'm most ideologically or policy aligned, but I have definitely shifted over time to, to, um, sort of motives and and intent to what Roger said and sort of how I pick people because ultimately we can't anticipate, first of all, no one elected official has the ability to do what they say they're going to do without, <laughs> without the help of many other people. Even executives have to appoint, you know, uh, uh, administrators to do the work and those people. So, so people, so I look a lot more to, does this person come from a place of, compassion of integrity are they going to appoint good people and hire a good staff or just bring on their you know friends who may have privilege or other blind spots um can i trust them in a crisis you know things like that that i feel like gavin and Corey in particular but most of the candidates that i've worked for i know their gut and their heart and i'm confident that you know the current pandemic is a perfect example like when i ran gavin's campaign I certainly did not know he was going to be managing a global pandemic in the biggest state in the country, but I think he's done an amazing job. And why? Because I think he's driven by the right things. He's thinking about equity issues. He's thinking about, you know, the, the poorest and the least among us when he's making these decisions. And, and could I have, do I agree with everything he's done? No. Could I have anticipated even, even this problem being in front of us if I had been smarter maybe, uh, but no, uh, but you know, you put people into, you put people of integrity and courage and compassion into positions of power. And then you sort of, if, if you, if you trust where they're coming from, you, you hope and pray in many ways, they're going to make good decisions and at least stand up for what they believe in, uh, in, in moments of difficulty and crisis. So for our next question, we're going to go to Julian. Hi. Um, and I think you guys kind of touched upon my question earlier in the last question. But, you know, in politics, a lot of, you know, young people especially feel as though everything happens behind closed doors. So, you know, how do you work with the candidates, specifically in the Democratic Party, to ensure that, you know, they're held accountable and to the same standard and that they are being transparent with their constituents about, you know, what is going on behind those closed doors and those, like, background room conversations that we think are, ha are happening, you know? Do you want to go first on this one, Myla? <laughs> uh, let's go Adisu, uh, Maya, then Bonter. Uh, no, I, <laughs> uh, I should have spoken up. No, I kid. Um, a lot does happen behind closed doors. I think there's a good reason for that often, right? If you're part of the job of elected officials in particular is to lead, and it is very difficult to, to lead, to debate, in public, right? To debate your own position in public, right? Uh, not that that doesn't have its own political value sometimes, but but you definitely need spaces behind closed doors for anybody who is who has who is in a position of public leadership to decide what they what they think, right? And and not every issue, you know, not every elected official or or potential elected official has a position on every single thing from day one, and you know, 
they need some spaces to be vulnerable and to, to form their opinions. And so in many ways, I think the responsibility of people like me, staffers, is to make sure that the perspectives that they get in that process that might be behind closed doors are diverse enough to let them come up with their own decisions. And then to, from a political perspective, have a public process that isn't fake and isn't just for show, but that allows them to refine their position and to, um, and to lead and sort of bring the public along in many, in many ways, as opposed to, uh, uh, you know, be wishy-washy in, uh, in public about what you think. And so there's a, but, but I, I want to be clear, like, I don't think, I do think a lot happens behind closed doors in politics. And I think there's a good reason for that. <laughs> um, and the, and the question is, are the people who are monitoring those spaces opening the doors to, you know, voices that need to be heard. And I think this is somewhere where last thing I'll say, where I think having people like Roger and Maya and me being the gatekeepers to those rooms has a big value <laughs> uh, because, and, and to be fair, you know, I think Julian and Corey and, and Elizabeth, I would guess would have done it on their own anyway, <laughs> because of the people they are. So having good, having good uh, uh, leadership that, that thinks about this uh, on the front end and doesn't just turn to their friends or their donors or their whatever, but is actually looking for the opinion of activists and people who don't get into those rooms is, is a not insignificant piece of this. So um, yeah, policymaking is a, is a messy business. It, it's not going to happen uh, entirely sort of in, in the public sphere, but, um, but if, as long as we can provide and the people who have the, who have control of the gate provide access to the folks who may not, be able to, you know, work the network to get access uh, and be proactive about reaching out to those folks. I think we can, I think it's okay. I 100% agree with that. I think that is, that's, and I, and I think it's hard because so much of what we talk about when we think about politics and, and kind of the worst pieces about it is this idea that it's like, okay, well you say one thing and then you go behind the closed doors and do something different. And that is, what Adisu is describing is not that, right? But I, th I think there is almost this, like, we just kind of have this idea about like, oh, the closed door and then the real deals happen. I think that, right, like, I think that just like anything, that space allows people to figure out, okay, how is this going to, how do you operationalize, um, you know, what your values are? I feel like the piece of it that is so public for everyone is you get to know what this person's instincts are and where they, where they want to be. And then, there's an entire process of, okay, how do we actually get that done? And I do think that there needs to be that, that space, but right, as long as it's not, I think for so long, the assumption was, okay, fine. But then when the doors close, it's going to be people, the moneyed interests are going to come in and make sure that nothing really ever changes for people. Um, so much of what we saw, I think, in this cycle was, power actually being conferred to folks that have been doing this work to activists to folks on the ground who like who know what this actually means and what comes out of that is genuinely sort of a, it's a it's a better process right so i think that's it i think it's right it's making sure that the right people are there to help influence where it actually ends up and how it looks um and to be able to say hey, this is actually how that's going to look on the ground so be careful about that yeah, and I, I echo everything that both Maya and Visu said. I mean, um, you know, obviously, you know, when this all started in politics, you know, our politicians were in D.C. literally six months a year and didn't go back home. Um, there was no cable television. There was no Internet. There was no Twitter. Um, you know, the way that government worked and the, 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 the connectivity that it had with the constituencies and the people they represented was just not the same as it is now. And it's better, right? It's better now because people are more connected. There's a greater expectation that an account of accountability and transparency from our elected officials. Uh, and I think, generally speaking, I think that's a very, very good thing, right? Uh, people are going to be more representative, or if not, not, then at least, you know, uh, in a position where they have to explain, you know, what they're doing um, and not just be able to get away with, with having conversations behind closed doors. I mean, I think that there's been a movement towards that, you know, whether it's because people are want to do that or whether because they're forced to. I mean, you know, once upon a time when I first started doing politics, and I'm sure uh, these two Maya would agree, town halls were things that politicians did because they had to do them. It's not because they wanted to do it, right? It was like, people, you know, it was the way that people held our elected officials accountable. But now it's like, you know, Elizabeth Warren, you know, famously did, but 200, you know, town halls and, you know, selfie line and all these things. She didn't do uh, private meetings with donors. 
I mean, I think that, you know, part of it was, you know, yes, we are not doing these things. These things are complicated, you know, and, you know, meeting behind closed doors and selling access uh, can be problematic. But to DC Maya's larger point, I think that, you know, making sure that it's not just the fact that you're not having closed door meetings, because the reality is those things still happen. Private conversations still happen. And as DC said, there needs to be space, you know, to be thoughtful and have, uh, you know, honest, authentic conversations that are not just performative. Um, but it's not only who's in the room, it's not only who's sitting at the table. Maya and I were talking about this. You know, you could be in the room but not, but not be part of the conversation. You could be part of, you know, have a seat at the table and not be a player. Like, we need to make sure that, you know, we're getting the right people who are organizers, community activists, you know, um, you know, people who represent the, not the powerful, you know, being treated the same way as the donor class, lobbyists, and people who are paid professionals uh, at being part of it. You know, you need to have a seat at the table, but you also have the, you need to have chips to be able to play. Yeah, you know? and I think that that is a conversation and struggle that's ongoing. You know, for you know, I think all of our bosses, each one of us, especially people like us who are thinking about how we broaden that room and broaden those conversations, so that you know we can continue having you know thoughtful conversations that have more views represented, so we can get uh, a better discussion, better debate, and getting be uh, better things done to serve more people. Um, so I really want to respect your time. So uh, for our closing, uh, is there like one sentence of advice you would give our members who are like interested in pursuing careers in politics? Uh, let's go um, Adisu, Roger, then Maya. Yeah, one sentence is enough. Uh, <laughs> no, I think I, I saw, <clears throat> I'm sorry we couldn't get to everybody's questions. I saw somebody ask a question about mentorship and I think, um, I think finding mentors is exceptionally important if you want to do this as a career. Um, and those mentors do not have to look like you, um, though I think oftentimes those are the easiest ones to find. But um, to Roger's point, I've had, you know, Michael Hooley, I'm sure is who you were thinking of, uh, you know, the whitest Irishest guy <laughs> in politics who, you know, called me a couple days ago and I was like, uh, I will always take his call because he yeah. me. me. Um, so, they don't, they don't always have to look like you, but mentorship is, is not nothing here. And, and it, it has to happen organically a little bit. Don't force it, right? You have to build a relationship with somebody that, that's real. But um, so a, a person who, is, who, is, who has what you, at least at this point in your life, perceive as the career or life that you may want to pursue, that can help guide you, that can help teach you, that, can, that you can feel comfortable asking un uncomfortable questions is an incredibly important part of building a career in this business. And um, and I would just encourage you to seek that out and look for it uh, wherever you can. Yeah, I think that's, that's really good advice. And there, I feel like there's so many things we can say um, and I'm trying to figure out the one that's most profound or, um, but I, I guess for those who are interested in pursuing this path uh, that, um, that this glamorous path that Maya, Disu and I have decided to go down, um, what I'll say is this, you know, you, you do not look at it as a career. You know, do not think of this as a something you do professionally where if you do step one, take step two, take step three, you pass this test, you're gonna continue moving on and there's, it's sort of linear in terms of progress. That's just not the way it works. Um, to me, you know, it's less of a career and more like a string of sort of life experiences that you wanna have and just like, skills you want to learn and things that you get excited about and things that, that you know, keep you passionate. Um, again, it comes down to understanding that what, we're, what you're doing when you decide to do this stuff. And, you know, for many people, you know, it's only for a little while, you know, it's only until they decide they, you know, want to pursue other things like, you know, other careers, other passions, have a family, uh, other responsibilities you have to have. But while you're doing it, you know, recognizing that it's, you know, not just working to live and pay bills, it's, you know, living to work because you love what you do. So, I can honestly say that um, I've, in most instances, I've chosen, you know, in my career choices that of what I care about the most and what I'm most interested and passionate about and not the job or opportunity that seems like it would quote unquote be the best for my career because that's just not the way it works. And, you know, frankly, the second that you are in a job in politics that feels like a job, then it's a job and it's like, holy cow, I'm getting up, I'm working and I don't even care about this. And, Frankly, I could be making a lot more money, doing a lot more things, you know, in the private sector, and it's not worth it anymore. So follow your passion, find your passion, and just understand, you know, that 
what draw, which got you interested in the first place is going, what, is going to be what sustains you. It's not going to be about the money. It's not going to be about the titles. It's not going to be about you know, what appears in your resume. All right, well, I will close out. I um, also got a chance and, and, and I share the apologies that we didn't get a chance to get to everyone's questions, but I did see one that was specifically asking about the experience of being a woman in politics. So I wanna sort of gear my advice uh, specifically toward um, women who wanna, wanna work in uh, political fields. And I think one of the things that has always struck me is that I think that as women, we are very often professionally socialized in a way that is particularly unhelpful in, in the political world. And that is that, um, you know, and I think this is, this is probably true for a lot of people, but I think especially with women, I think especially for women of color, there's this sense of don't, you know, you sort of, you, we develop our confidence as leaders through being subject matter experts. If I'm the one who knows the most about X, then I can, I'm comfortable raising my hand to correct people on it. I'm comfortable saying, yes, I should be the one leading this team because I know the most about this thing. The difficulty is that in, in political jobs, very often the person is, who is in charge is a person that is kind of least briefed on each individual thing. Their job is to kind of bring the team together, be the connector and be the one to sort of see the whole board. So I think that there's a discomfort that a lot of women experience moving into senior levels in political jobs because there is the sense of, well, I shouldn't be running this meeting because that person knows more than I do about this particular issue, or I, sh I shouldn't say anything because maybe the issue is that I don't understand this. It's not that it's not understandable. I just don't get it. And I want to encourage you. I know it's hard to basically say, this is a problem. Stop doing it. Um, I know it's how we all sort of came up and how we all got told to, to, to be nice at meetings and, and you don't want to offend anyone with the knowledge that they might have, you know, said something completely wrong. And so you figure out different ways to couch that or you don't raise your hand or you assume that if it went over your head, that was because you missed something, not because, hey, there's actually a hole in the logic here, we should rethink it. But I, I beg you to try to fight against that because your judgment is a skill set and it's a skill set that will that that can serve you in these roles but i think that we don't always get told from professionally young enough ages right that um that that's true that 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 we have judgment that we can bring to bear in in moments like that so that's what i would i would say I, again it's it's easier said than done um, I know a lot of times uh, women and and I, I love this like people will sort of do it for each other and kind of you know say oh hey wasn't that the point you made or you know text someone else and say wait did this make sense to you before you want to raise your hand and do it do that if you want to do it you know have that be the way you get into it but just remember that a it's not you. A lot of people are guessing at the table. Your guess is as good as anybody else's. So put it out there and, and just sort of lean in because you're, you know, there, there's a lot of value you're bringing. Well, um, Bajra, Adisu, and Maya, thank you all so much for taking time out of your busy schedules to speak with us today. Um, I'm sure that our members have gained some really valuable insights from your experiences and your perspectives. Um, so before we wrap up this panel, I just want to give a special shout out to Julian and Sashu, um, who've been typing captions behind the scenes like throughout this panel. So um, our closing session of Summit is coming up next. So I hope that everyone has enjoyed Summit and will join us for a final recap and a message from a really special guest. Hi. Thanks, Thank you. Bye. Thank you all. Bye. Bye.